I'm still in uh, Nehemiah, and we're going to look at another section of this book of Nehemiah. We're talking about how we can have a better future. And there are so many things that are involved, or so many things that are important to me, and they, I think, also are important to you. But if we're not careful, we can miss, we can maybe miss some of the important things that we need to understand or have a better understanding of if we want to have a better future. Obviously, we can't look at the news and say, oh, we're going to have a better future. We can't look at the stock market and say, oh, we're going to have a better future. Or we can't look at a hundred other things that we see nearly every day and get encouraged about a better future. So therefore, we're going to let Nehemiah, again, give us another lesson on how you and I can build a better future. As we look at today's lesson, we're going to focus in on how Nehemiah was able to stand strong when he faced opposition. And I've been reading through this book now for several, several weeks, and as I looked at what I would be saying today, it was almost like something was telling me, you know what, I'm just not real sure how this is going to relate to the crowd that you're going to have at Light Point on Sunday morning. So I would go back and I would reread and I would look at it again. And, and I thought, well, you know, that could be right for many, many people. But I'm going to even say this. Even if today's lesson is just for one or two people, which I know is for more, more than just those, uh, it's going to be a lesson from God's Word. And let's say you don't need it. But you're, the person sitting to your right or to your left, don't, don't, don't hit them with your arm. Let's say maybe they need it. You'll say, Pastor Rich, thank you for sharing what you shared today. So we're going to look at this scripture. I'm going to get a drink so I can talk at least for a couple hours. I've got that two-hour thing on my mind today, don't I, huh? That's the third time I've referred to two hours. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> Anytime God leads you or leads me to do something that is good, something that is meaningful, maybe something that is generous, and something that is lasting, we need to expect there will be opposition. I'm not saying every time, in every case, but we need to expect, not to be negative, but expect there will be opposition, there will be obstacles, and there will be resistance, and there will be lots and lots of reasons that come to your mind as to why you shouldn't, couldn't, and wouldn't do it. So that's the basis for what we're talking about today. And we have some great examples in, in the Bible. I think we have the example of Adam and Eve and Whoop, there was a serpent, right? We had Moses, and then, oh, who was there? There was Pharaoh. We had David, and, oh, there was Goliath. Go to the New Testament. We have Jesus and the list, the list that were on his name. Herod, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, Judas, the devil, and the demons. I could say there was Batman, and he had Joker, okay? Nehemiah, he had Sambala and Tobiah. These guys were thorns in his flesh. These guys were the ones that were causing all kind of problems for him. So I'm not going to give a bunch of background because I've been doing that the last couple of weeks, and you can go and read chapters one through three or four and, and, and get caught up a little bit. 
But we know that Nehemiah, he's this cupbearer, okay, to the king of Persia, a regular guy, wasn't a preacher, wasn't ordained, he wasn't a, a bishop, um, he wasn't um, somebody that um, you would think that would be a person that was going to do what he was going to do. And he heard about the homeland of his that was broken and it was torn down, the walls were down, the gates were torn down, burned down. And so brokenhearted Nehemiah travels some thousand miles um, and he tries to inspire his people and he's trying to attempt to do something that is considered to be absolutely the impossible. One of the first things he did, and you'll read this in the scripture, and you'll probably for sure read it once I tell you what it is. Um, the first thing that Nehemiah wanted to do, he wanted to rebuild the gates. Um, so uh, there was a sheep gate, the fish gate, the valley gate, the horse gate, the water gate, the dung gate. Yeah, I'm not making these up. <laughs> They're in the Bible, okay? <clears throat> And there these are these gates, and you know, and he's got people working for him. Oh, by the way, they weren't masons, they weren't carpenters, they weren't skilled people. The people he had working with him to help him do this was a goldsmith, um, perfume makers, and merchants. Now these are the people he has helping him rebuild these gates and eventually rebuild the wall. And so now he's making some progress. It seems like things are kind of going on a little bit. The work has started. And as the work has started, guess what happens? Opposition shows up when the work gets started. Opposition shows up. And I'm just convinced this morning that there's things in your life that you can relate to. But before we do that, let's go to the scripture. Um, when Sambalat heard that, they, that we were rebuilding the walls, um, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Um, he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Let's stop right there. The word feeble in the, uh, in, in, in the original language means it's described as a flower that's been cut off. And it's just dead. It's of no value. It's of no use. What are these feeble Jews doing? Would they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? You see any sarcasm in that? Will they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? And burn as they are, Tobiah the, Ammon, the Ammonite, was, uh, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up it would break down their walls of stone. So we see there's some stuff going on that really is not pleasant. It's really, really not pleasant. The, the opposition shows up um, and uh, it comes alive when the work gets started. And right now, right now, in your mind, you might say, okay, pastor, uh, yeah, okay, I can relate with that. I can definitely relate with that. You know what? Um, um, I, um, I have a story. I have a story. You know, we want to get back in church. And uh, we haven't been in church for a while, so we want to get started back into a church. And, and on our way to church, we had one of the biggest fights we've ever had. The kids were fighting we were fighting as husband and wife. We were saying things we shouldn't have been saying. And then we walk into the church and we smile. But to get there, it wasn't anything fun. It was awful. It was awful. Maybe you're trying to get out of debt. And maybe you have sat down with your spouse or yourself or your accountant or your financial advisor. And you've got a plan all worked out how this can all take place. And you get on this track, and maybe you're saying, okay, in the midst of all of this, and we're going to start tithing too. We're going to start tithing, and guess what happens? The very first week, the car breaks down. You have a $700 car, car repair bill, and you say, oh, my goodness. Now, wouldn't that be opposition? 
huh? It's not people making fun of you because you're trying to build some gates, uh, the dung gates and the fish gates and the water gates and all that, but it's because you're trying to do what is right and, and there is opposition right in your way. Maybe you're saying, I want to get involved in doing something meaningful, whether it be in church or in my community, or, or maybe I want to work. Maybe I want to sign up for the nursery. I was back there the other day, and I saw, man, it's a beautiful nursery, and, and I want to sign up for the nursery. And you get back there, and the first Sunday you serve, you know, there's this kid that just pukes up all over you. And I mean, you, st- you haven't had that since you were, yeah, since your kids were little 30 years ago. What is it? Things happen when we want to do something that is very meaningful. Maybe you have a heart to really get involved in somebody else's life. Maybe, maybe there's somebody that you really, really, really want, want to help, and, 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 and there's all this that's unfolding, and someone finds out that you're doing this, and they call you stupid, and what would you do that for? Other people try to help those people, and, and you know, it's just a waste of your time. What is it? That's called Opposition. Don't be surprised when you face opposition. Advancement, you might want to write this down. You have several places to write notes uh, because you don't have that many many blanks to fill in this morning. But don't be surprised. Advancement invites opposition. Advancement invites opposition. The devil doesn't bother those who aren't doing anything. The devil doesn't bother those who are not a threat. So if you want an easy life, I've got a story for you. I've got a story for you for the easy life, okay? Don't get involved. Just coast along. Be comfortable with all of your surroundings. Live your comfy life, um, you know, and maybe even take a picture, and, you know, and, uh, of yourself, a selfie, and you can put it on Facebook or on Instagram, and you can let people know just how cool your life is, and there's just nothing going on except you're just satisfying yourself. Um, And if you want to go to church, you can if you want to, but, you know, don't engage and don't pray and don't serve and don't give and don't really start caring because that's when things start to unfold. Um, And, you know, if you want to do something a little bit spiritual, you know, just to make you feel good, but it won't really make any big difference. Go ahead and do that too. But the moment you step out in faith, the battle is on and real opposition because you become a target. I become a target when we, when we want to do something to make a difference. And I believe this morning, as we look at this story, we're going to go through some more verses here. I believe with all of my heart that there is somebody in this room today that God is calling you to do something and he's wanting you to possibly step up, to possibly step up. So, you know, in the face of opposition, uh, what should we do? How should we react? Well, uh, to the naysayers and to the critics and to those that, the haters and the doubters. Well, most of the time, I don't think you, you need to respond to them. Did you hear me? Our first nature, we want to defend ourselves. And we want to make our case. But Nehemiah didn't do that. Notice what he did. He doesn't respond. He doesn't answer. He doesn't defend. Because you're never going to convert your critics. And when you respond, you really validate them and you're giving them really some power. So as we look at what Nehemiah does here, it's very, very powerful because I think it's a lesson for every single one of us. There are haters. There are those that are difficult. But you know what? The more difficult people are not the ones that you expect to oppose you. I'm going to take it a step further. When maybe your closest friends and those that you love and those that love you, when they begin to oppose something that you're doing, it could be that we have a husbands and wives here this morning. Maybe one of you want to do something and you're being drugged down by the other one. I'm sorry, but that could be the case. Maybe not, maybe in the other county, maybe not here. But anyway, it could be here. Just in case it is here, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Maybe there's somebody in your life that's very, very important to you, and you maybe bounce things off of them quite often before you actually do it. And those people are really the ones that are kind of leaving you and opposing you with what you want to do. It could even be a dad or a mom. It could be a brother or a close friend. 
Maybe you um, feel led to foster some, some kids or a child. And everybody's saying, well, you can't even <laughs> take care of the kids you've got. <laughs> and um, now you're really discouraged. You see what I'm saying? There's always going to be somebody in our life. Always going to be somebody in our life. I can think of back when I knew the call of God was on me to, to become a minister. And I knew I had the call of God on my life. And, um, and while well, we had good jobs and, and uh, things were going well and getting ready to buy a new home and, and all of that. Uh, and then God calls me into the ministry. I had people say, why in the world would you do that? Preachers don't make good money. My goodness, sounds to me like that's just a lot of problems ahead of you. And there was all these other things that were going on. It wasn't from a bunch of people. It came from a family of ministers, and they were very supportive. But there were those. There were those that were in my life that thought I was being a person led off to do something that was going to really, really cause me a lot of trouble. So maybe God's calling you to do something. Maybe God is calling you to, to do something that would be, wow, to maybe all of us. But you know what? We need to become cheerleaders for those. It's basically in the body of Christ. We need to be their cheerleaders and help them as they're going through this whole thing of trying to find out God's will for their life. I have another little thing I want you to write down. I try not to be moved by praise or by criticism. All right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define these. If we're moved by praise, it could go to our head. And if we're moved by criticism, it can go to our heart. So I try not to be moved by praise or criticism. Now, obviously, I'm a human being, okay? <laughs> and so are you. It's more pleasant when someone says something nice to you and gives you some affirmation or says something very, very complimentary or nice. That's way better than for a person to walk up to you and say something very negative to you. Now, if you would raise your hand and say, no, that's the opposite for me. I love negative responses. I want to meet you after the church, and we have a nurse that can check your temperature to make sure you're okay. What is it? But if we're not moved by the praise or the criticism, it will help us to stay on the path that God has for us. So Nehemiah, he doesn't answer his critics. He is answering to God. Now, instead of engaging... Um, to the lower level, he turns to the higher power. Now, this prayer that he's going to pray in verse 4, this is before the New Testament was given. This is before we had the scripture, turn the other cheek, okay? But look at this prayer. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads, their own heads, and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity, do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And so we rebuilt the wall till all the, it reached its half, uh, the half of its height. For the people worked with all of their hearts. Now, that prayer might be something that sometimes you want to pray. And I'm not saying pray it, but you know what? It probably felt pretty good to Nehemiah just to kind of get that out there, right? And maybe there are things that you say to God uh, just kind of get off your chest, and God can handle that too, all right? He can handle that. But as what happens, um, Nehemiah, in the midst of opposition, here's what took place. There was times when he paused and he prayed, and then there was times when he got back to work. And then there was times when he paused and he prayed, and then he got back to work. And I find people sometimes, uh, they'll kind of use maybe prayer as a, oh, help me, Jesus, to say this right. They could. They could use prayer as something that is good, but then they don't want to put any legs to their prayer, any legs at all. 
you know, and I know that God given, has given us many, many prayer warriors within our churches and within our lives. And, and I believe people, you know, that's one of their main ministries. And, but Nehemiah, he paused to pray, and then he gets back to work. And he paused to pray, and he gets back to work. And yes, and there was both the spiritual and the practical that he allowed to be in his life. And pray as if everything depends on God, and work as if everything depends on you. That's pretty good, right? Pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on us. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of its labors is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Last week, we talked about the progress that was being made. This week, we see some discouragement. It's been around for a long time. This is years and years ago. And maybe you see progress this last week. Oh, maybe this last week it was a powerful week. And I don't want to be negative, but look out. <laughs> this week it might be a little bit different. It might be a week when you could possibly get discouraged. Also, our enemy said, before they know it as, uh, or, or, or they see us, um, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near, near them came and told us 10 times over, whatever you, wherever you turn, they will attack you. Wherever you turn, they will attack you. Now we got the people of Judah. They're beginning to doubt. They're beginning to dis, get discouraged here. And in the midst of the external haters and in the midst of the relational haters and in, re, in the midst of, of all the other things that could be taking place, do you know what could be one of the very, very most important things for you to consider today that could be happening to you during times of discouragement? And I think probably everybody will agree with me. Most of the times, it's the internal opposition. It's the internal opposition. Most times it might not even be my best friend or not my best friend or my neighbor or a family member. Sometimes, sometimes the inner, inner, the inner part of me is my biggest, worst enemy. So you have an opportunity right now to fill your blanks in, okay? The external opposition will only be as loud as my internal insecurities will allow them to be. And folks, I have found that to be true so many times. It was my daddy that gave me courage. It was my daddy that instilled within me that I am somebody. I'm no better than anybody else, but I'm as good as anybody. And square your shoulders, lift your head, and walk through the crowd. You can do it. You can do it. And when we have those internal insecurities, I think we all have them. And maybe you hide yours very well. Maybe nobody else knows about them. But you do. And so does God. And maybe even so does the enemy, not giving him credit. I'm just saying, the external opposition will only be as loud as the internal insecurities allow them to be. So that's the, first, the moment that Nehemiah started to battle in his, with his own insecurities and, um, and begin to focus uh, on God and not himself. Um, we have this in verse 14. After I looked things over, kind of reset here, get refocused. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. I think that's the best part of this lesson today. We need to remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When you're discouraged, absolutely. When you're on the mountaintop, yes. No matter where you are, no matter what level or what plane you may be on, we need to remember that the Lord is great and the Lord is awesome. That builds my courage just saying it. And say it out loud to yourself. Say it out loud to God. Say it out loud to those that are opposing you. And say it out loud to anybody that might be nearby. Remember the Lord your God, who is great 
and who is awesome. And now we're taking the focus off of ourself and we're putting it on God. Because you know what? It's not our battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. Whatever battle that you're fighting, as a child of God, he wants you to team up with him. And the scripture that we have in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We also have the scripture, If God be for us, who be against us? And I like one, I think it was Maxwell said, If God be for us, who cares who's against us? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If God's for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. And then Paul said, what will separate us from the love of Christ? And he gives a whole list of things. Nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Remember the Lord your God. And when we look back, I think Nehemiah maybe remembered the fact that, you know, when, when God rescued his, his ancestor, the Egyptian, that were in bondage. When God split the Red Sea and they crossed over on dry land. Remember when God led us by fire by night and, and the manna that came from heaven. And there is many, many times in your life, if you just go back, go back, maybe take and look in your journal or write some, some things down. Write down where God has done things. Otherwise, you can't forget them. You really can. But you know what? When the devil comes knocking on my door and when he tries to discourage me, the best thing I can do and the best thing you can do is remember the Lord your God. We've all had some dark days. And I know we've got people sitting here this morning, you're going through some dark days, some dark days with your health, some dark days with the health of your, the health of your parents, and the dark days of losing maybe a best friend. These, these can be dark days. They really can be. You know what? And, and it's always been. There's going to either be a dark day, either you're in a dark day, or it's going to be one coming. It's going to be a part of our life. And that's why we need to remember the Lord our God. All right, point number two, the second blank you can fill in. The greater the opposition against you, the greater the opportunity for God to fight for you. Oh, my goodness. Write that down. You can take that to the bank. You can cash that in and get a tremendous return. The greater the opposition, the greater the opportunity that our God has to fight for us. That's why we have to include him into all of our plans. And don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families and your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I have a question this morning. What are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? If you're over here and when that little picture I painted a little bit ago of this, you know, twirling your thumbs and kind of doing nothing and taking selfies and, and, and that's kind of where your life is right now and, and, you know, come what may and, you know, if it doesn't happen, it does happen and, you know, if, uh, whatever. That's not going to cut it. I think we need to fight for some things. And there are some things that I will fight for. There are some things that I will fight for. I will fight for my boys. I'll fight for my grandkids, and I'll fight for you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. The devil is out to destroy, to kill, and to, and to, and to, and, and, and to all, root up everything that is good. We need to be willing to stand up and fight for that which is right and for that which is important. What are you fighting for? Remember the Lord your God and keep fighting. And keep fighting. Yes, you had that, you had that setback, but still keep fighting to get debt free. Don't give up on it. Keep fighting to get debt free. Maybe your marriage has had some pretty rough times. And maybe you're maybe you're just about ready to just almost just throw in the towel. I just say one more time: keep fighting. Keep fighting for your marriage. Maybe you have a child or a grandkid and they have a terrible, terrible addiction and it looks awful. It looks bleak. 
It is sad. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep fighting. Let God know that we're on his side and we need him to fight with us, for us. Keep fighting. Maybe there's somebody that you work with. Maybe they work for you. And you hear every day something horrible or awful going on in their life. And they don't have anybody else. It could be that you're the person that God put in their life. It could be that you're that person. Help them fight for them. Maybe you have a loved one this morning. And they're away, way, way far from God. And you've prayed. You quit being preachy. Thank you. You quit being preachy to them. But you don't know what to do. You know, I've got people in my life that I'm praying for. They aren't, they aren't believers. I just want to admit something this morning. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to know what to do in sharing Christ to those who need him. Forty years ago, I would knock on somebody's door and I would say, if you would die today, would you have the assurance of going to heaven? And they would even let me in and talk to him for a little bit. Why, if I would do that today, they'd probably get their gun out and call 911. We got somebody over here that lost his brain. He's talking about dying in heaven. So let me say this. There's nobody here but that scissor. Okay, this is it. I've got a few people right now that are on my mind, they're on my heart, and it's my desire, and my faith is strong, and God is working. This one individual has been over two, over two years, over two years, and I believe he's getting close. And the other day, He knocked on this door. And he came in. And we sat down out there in the foyer. And he wanted to just unload and share with me something that he was going through emotionally and something he was going through even physically. And you might say, Did you do it? Did you get him on his knees and pray with him then? Did it happen? I thought maybe it would too. But after our conversation, he knows me. He knows me well. Obviously, he knows where I work. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And my job right now is just to let this man know I really, really care for him. And I exhibit that every week or as often as we meet up. I always let him know that I'm here. I care. I'm praying for him. Whatever I can do to help him. It hasn't happened yet. But it's going to. And it might not be the way that I think it's going to happen. He's probably not going to walk in here and kneel at this altar. And I'm going to pound him on the back and want him to Christ. Let me tell you, that's not the way it's going to happen. Because I would never do that. Pound him on the back. Unless God want me to. Maybe to celebrate. What's my point? I know it's difficult. Folks, I know it's difficult. I've been doing this for a lot of years. I probably have won more people to the Lord outside of the building than inside the building over the last 10, 15, 20 years. I understand that. Whether it be by their bed or, 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 or in their living room or, or whatever it might be. But for, I know it's difficult. But we, quit, we, can't keep, we can't quit fighting. 
We can't just give up and say, well, you know, it is what it is, and, and I, I'm trying to live a life before them, and, and they know where I work now, so I'm done. No. You're just getting started. You're just getting started. Here's what it's called. It's called being the hands and the feet. It's called being the light and being salt. That's all in the Bible. Let's be salt and let's be light. Let's keep fighting for those who need Christ in such a powerful way. You got one more blank, don't you? Here it is. If I'm not ready for opposition, for my obedience to God, I'm not ready to be used by God. If I'm not ready to face the opposition for my obedience to God, see, some people, if it's going to be opposition, they're going to, okay, I, I can't do it. So now they're not going to be obedient because they don't want opposition. If I'm not ready to face opposition for, for my obedience to God, I'm not ready to be used by God. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I don't think there's anything that needs to be said to add to that. I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. So let's be strong. Let's be loving. Let's be caring. Let's be those people. Yes, we are going to face opposition. But the good news is we can stand strong when we're facing it. We can stand strong when we're facing it. I don't know what yours is. I don't know what it is. Maybe you don't either. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. But if you're going to be obedient to God, there will be opposition in your life. As a Christ follower, if you're never opposed, if you go along with all that they talk about at work and all the things that the unbelievers do and, and you use their same language and you tell their same jokes and, and, you, and you live their same lifestyle, absolutely. There won't be any opposition. But that's not who we are. As Christ followers, we're to stand strong. There are some things that are non-negotiable in my life. You can't get me to move. You can't get me to compromise them. You can't get me to kind of come over on your side. There are some things that are absolutely non-negotiable. Do you have some of those things in your life? I bet you do, and you should. Amen. It all needs to line up with the Word of God. Nehemiah, wow, he just keeps helping us out, doesn't he? We can have a better future. We can have a better future, but it, part of it is standing firm, standing strong when opposition comes our way.